look at NRLM in a very organic way. So it starts with vulnerability assessment to identify who are the poor, who are the poorest and this would be done in a participatory manner. The second step would be in motivating the poor to come together to build their own organizations. So this is the institution building, capacity building phase where we ensure that all poor are part of one network or the other. So the base unit is the self-help group of women and then there is a federation of these self-help groups at the village level and a further federation at either block level or below the block level. So building these uh, institutions, nurturing these institutions is really a very important part of NRLM. The third part will be enabling these institutions to be linked to the mainstream financial institutions so that the resources required for their livelihoods, resources required for their needs are met in a cost effective manner. The fourth uh, layer in this, the fourth uh, step is promotion of livelihoods for the poor and uh, whatever strategies are required for that will be pursued and finally enabling the poor either directly or through their institutions accessing services whether it's the PDS, whether it's health, education, accessing the services which are their entitlements. So this enables them to enjoy a good uh, quality of life. The, uh, the way in which we have uh, visualized the rolling out of an RLM, uh, the first and foremost requirement is that states, state government prepares a perspective plan for the state. So the difference between earlier approaches and this approach is that we also know that each state has its own uh, specific requirements and states are, all states are not at the same level. So the state government taking advantage of resource agencies, resource organizations it has, first takes stock of who are the poor in their state, what is the situation in their state, what has worked in the state, what has not worked. So keeping this in mind, and also the core NRLM principles that poverty eradication through institutions of the poor. So the state government has a plan of action, has a seven year plan of action, also says that what it will do in the first year. So the first and foremost requirement is a state government developing its own action plan, which also means that every district will prepare its action plan. The second basic requirement, second challenge as you, you may call it is that the NRLM provides for dedicated support structures at the state, district, block and even below the block level. So the requirement for each state is to set up a mission set up a, a dedicated uh, structure at the state level, recruit people, train people. So this is a very, very important requirement that state government sets up a mission, appoints the chief executive officer, mission recruits the multidisciplinary specialists who are required at the state level, district level and uh, below that. And the people who are recruited then have to be provided proper training. They should understand how they should work with the poor. They have to live with the poor. Understand what kind of poverty eradication strategies have worked in their state. So not only recruitment but training of the people who have been recruited is a very important requirement. And the success of this program will depend on 
how well people have been selected, how well they have been recruited. In order for the state government to build on the work that has already happened. You see, we are not at ground zero. So different states have done this poverty eradication work in, a, in their own way. So there are good NGOs, there are good government initiatives. So in areas where nothing has happened, they start from ground zero. But where things have happened, then the state government have to uh, evolve mechanisms of partnerships with government agencies, with NGOs who have done this work on ground, and then see how this can be taken to the next level. So the support structure, which includes both what the state governments will do by themselves and also what they will do in partnerships, is the next challenge which is there with the states. NRLM would like to start with the problems that the poorest face. Keeping that in mind, we are looking at four kinds of uh, livelihoods promotion activities. One is vulnerability reduction, which, would, which could comprise of getting them out of debt bondage, uh, providing food security intervention, some support for health issues helping them to cope with health shocks. So whatever are issues around uh, uncertainties in poor people's lives, so how to deal with that? So that comes under the uh, you know, category of vulnerability reduction strategies. And there are some very, very good practices across the country. So based on that, the different district level teams would propose these strategies. The second stream is looking at their primary livelihoods. Between 80 to 90 percent of the livelihoods in the rural areas would be around agriculture, livestock, fisheries, non-timber forest produce. So we will be doing a very exhaustive value chain analysis of each of these livelihood sector and we will enhance the knowledge of the SSG members, farmers, youth, around these core livelihoods. So it is doing better what they are already doing. So it is not new knowledge, not, not new livelihoods. This we, hold, we believe that it, this holds a lot of potential and particularly in agriculture because agriculture is extremely critical from not only employment point of view, but from food security point of view. So we would like to see poor people with very small holdings, making these holdings economically viable, enabling them to build their own food security. So current food security model is that, you know, we have rice or wheat from surplus states, it moves to deficit states. What we would like to do under NRLM is to enable each poor household with access to land, build its own food security and which is eminently possible. So we will be focusing a lot on the agriculture based livelihoods because we believe that it has tremendous potential for poverty eradication, employment and in situ food security. Then the third stream is for the younger people, so those who are uh, uh, educated or even those who are school dropouts would like to work in semi-urban urban areas. So we are tying up with the private sector, tying up with uh, training agencies who will assess the demand for trained people in uh, the semi-urban urban areas and design suitable skilling programs, skill upgradation programs and pick up youth from the rural areas provide them the skills and also provide placement for them. This uh, has been tried by the ministry over the last four or five years and has been extremely successful. The fourth stream is we would like to promote entrepreneurs from among the poor. So setting up micro enterprises 
within their village or vicinity of the village is a way by which they get employment and they also provide jobs to others. So these are the four streams of livelihoods and it's not, they're not mutually exclusive. So families could have a mix of these and uh, as they progress also the stress will you know, change from one to the other. Innovations hold the key in terms of livelihoods promotion, in terms of uh, even institution building. So it is a, you know, innovations are a means of accelerating our efforts to come out of poverty, reducing the time that is taken and innovators could be anywhere. And one of the most important uh, uh, things that at the district level, block level, people should be looking out for innovators from within the community. So the community best practitioners themselves. So they would have found a way, you know, which is more cost effective or which gives better return. So we, we are looking at a lot of grassroots innovators, community best practitioners who are then used by the project functionaries district or block level as role models, as trainers. So that is one role which innovations will play. But we are also looking at best practices within the country, best practices by whether it is uh, industry or uh, scientific institutions uh, or developmental organizations which looks at issues relevant for the poor. It could be issues relating to rural energy, it could be issues relating to drinking water or any other life, like for instance in agriculture. We are looking at innovations which can reduce the cost of cultivation. Innovations which enable agriculture to be resilient to climate change. Innovations which help farmers to cope with drought. So we look at best practices within the country which are relevant for the poor. So bringing those best practices to uh, educate, to inspire uh, households in these uh, rural areas will be a very important function and my expectation is that every functionary should be an innovator or at least should have the eyes to catch innovations, to encourage innovators. So that, I believe, will help us a lot and uh, will also uh, create a USP for NRLM that it's a process which encourages innovations. One of the biggest handicaps for poor people is that they are not connected, they are not linked to the formal financial sector. So they are in very exploitative relationship with the informal sector. So NRLM, by building strong institutions of the poor, then facilitates linkage between these self-help groups and their federations with the formal financial sector with the commercial banks. So NRLM strategy is first to build strong institutions of poor which show, demonstrate financial literacy, which demonstrate sound financial management of their internal resources and have a good and transparent accounting system which creates confidence in the formal system that yes, they could lend to these institutions. So that's on the demand side, building good quality financial institutions of the poor. On the supply side, we would like to work with the banks, with the bank staff to orient them about the potential of the poor, to orient them about the strength of the institutions in, uh, in terms of financial discipline, in terms of their own uh, uh, 
preparation of micro investment plans to prioritize their needs so sensitizing the bank uh, machinery is a very important task and we believe that financial inclusion holds the key since we estimate that about 100000 rupees per family is required and 90% of this 90 to 95% of this has to come from linkage with the formal financial sector we also seen that in recent years banks have also appreciated that lending to the sgs lending to the poor women is is a good banking practice because the repayment records are high so what we are looking at is furthering this relationship between the banks and the sgs but in many areas we find that bank finances still are not satisfactory so in those uh, places we are trying to look at alternatives uh, we are looking at a commercial bank adopting a district putting together a best team from the bank to work with the district mission units and uh, sensitizing both their staff and also building good practices to enhance the confidence of the managers in the credit worthiness of the shgs nrlm will be implemented in a phased manner the logic for the phasing is that in the guiding principles itself we have said that it's a process where institutions of the poor are built and institutions of the poor take a leadership role in driving the program so we believe that there is a need for uh, a very small number of blocks we are expecting about 10% of blocks in a state to be taken up for a intensive approach and in this uh, phase which lasts for about 3 years whatever are the best practices in the country in organizing the poor in doing capacity building for them in linking them with financial institutions promoting their livelihoods all the best practices of the country would be uh, tried out and in 3 years we will have heroes from this 10 blocks 10 person blocks so the community resource persons people who have made a significant dent in their own poverty so this social capital of trainers from among the poor would emerge in this first phase of 3 years and when we move to the remaining uh, blocks remaining districts of a state this human resource pool provides the leadership and will be playing a sheet anchor role in taking this forward in the remaining phases so therefore uh, we invest a lot in the first phase put in lot of efforts and the people who emerge from this first phase the poor people themselves will be driving the program in the remaining phases so there's a phasing strategy here and uh, we believe that this will be very uh, effective because the energies of the state mission district mission can be you know concentrated in a small number of blocks and villages nrlm seeks to reach out to all the poor households in the country and it's a gigantic task so it's not something which can be done by one institution as if the numbers are not uh, daunting we are also saying that nrlm is a comprehensive poverty eradication strategy so therefore the partnership with resource organizations who then bring their complementary strengths together for the sake of the poor 